Don, pull that microphone nice and close to you as well, sir, if you don't mind. Okay. Yeah, good morning to you, okay. sir. Well, good morning. It's good to be here. Great to have you along for the ride. And uh, you're running for re-election in the 91st, and you have challengers. That's true, two of them. Yeah, they're, uh, well, we've been, we met Joe DeSoto. I haven't uh, had Tammy Hess on the show yet, but all three of you agreed to be at our forum on the 16th and 17th. We'll be doing the political forum uh, with a variety of candidates at the uh, Berkeley County Commission Chambers, the second floor, 400 West Stevens Street. And we're going to go from 8 to noon on uh, Tuesday and 8 until close to noon on uh, Wednesday. And we'll feature candidates, uh, including uh, three of the four candidates for governor. Uh, Patrick Morrissey will not attend. Uh, we'll have uh, the three candidates uh, for state senate on the second day. And as I mentioned before, three candidates for the 91st. So, uh, Don, first and foremost, give me your impression of the uh, recently concluded legislative session. Interesting. Uh, we went through a lot of routine things, all the financial stuff. But towards the end of the session, two issues popped up that kind of distracted us a try, little. Try to not thump around so much there, Don. Every, <laughs> every time you do it, the microphone jumps on that sound. Okay, well, well, two issues popped up that kind of distracted us. One had to do with the uh, trust fund for unemployment payments. Yes. And uh, that was kind of came up late, and it was a little bit of a surprise to a lot of us. The uh, workforce people came over and gave us a big briefing, thousand slides of how they paid out the money, mm -hmm. but they missed over missed the key point. What I th understand happened is that during COVID, some extra money went into the fund, the trust fund. Now the trust fund had been set up with some triggers to adjust it depending on the rate of unemployment, and if it inched up a little bit these triggers would increase the amount the employers would pay. Mm -hmm. And if it dropped down some, it would lower it just to, you know, to keep it balanced and appropriate to what the current workforce situation was. Don, you got to sit still more, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what I'm banging into here. Yeah. And w what happened is that the COVID money was ended up in the fund, made it look like they were really doing well and low unemployment. The triggers kicked in to lower what the employers would pay. And all of a sudden, everybody realized that was a little one-time phenomena. And if we lower what the employers pay, we're, the trust fund might get dangerously low. Sure. And so that's what it was all about. And so what we had to do then was basically adjust the triggers for the short term until mm -hmm. we got past that little bump from the COVID money. But what complicated things is that was about the same time they were trying to introduce indexing to the payments. Yes. And that had failed the previous year or previous session, and it was coming up again, and that kind of confused things. Because about the same time, I think there was a steel plant that was closing and losing 600 people, and some other things yes. were closing down. And that wasn't the time to be juggling around and cutting back benefits for some people. So that made it even more complicated. Yeah, timing was difficult. <laughs> it was awkward. There were, I think there were two big factories in West Virginia that announced they were closing at that time. That, you're right. Uh, steel was one of them. And I kind of blame, I'm making some noise here, <laughs> but one of them I blame our current administration for letting China dump steel into the U.S. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just, that's just hurting us. But anyway, that's sort of outside the scope of today. It's just, but we ended up not doing the indexing and adjusting the triggers on the fund. And so we got past that one. Mm -hmm. Of course, the other exciting thing at the end was the clawback. I believe you guys have already discussed that. Yes. <laughs> so I won't go into a lot of details there. Our understanding is that that's not going to be a factor. Well, that's, people are optimistic now that the negotiations are going well. Mm -hmm. But even so, we passed something that we called a skinny budget and cut some things out, and uh, particularly things that were scheduled to be in the uh, excess, till we knew 100% for sure what was going to happen. <laughs> what was going to happen with the clawback? If it's optimistic, if the optimistic, I won't call it a dream, <laughs> optimistic part happens, they give us a break on it. They agree that they're not going to claw it back. Then we can go back and adjust the budget during the not the first interim session or next week or so but the next one after that okay and restore some of the things that people are pretty concerned and upset about and let's, so that's let's that's, let's talk about your decision to run for re-election john okay well 
I guess the decision was I've 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 been there a couple of terms. I've learned how the system works. I've learned how to work the system. I'm getting into some things that I think are important, and I'd like to see them through a little further. Give me an example of some things you'd like to see further. Well, okay, one of the big ones is uh, uh, rural health, and uh, we were tried to get something through. I'm the, sorry, did you say rural health? Rural, rural. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> and we tried to get something through last time that we called neighborhood hospitals. Mm -hmm. And about the same time we did that, I think West Virginia University Medical, shortly after all this, came out with their plan for neighborhood hospitals. And that goes along with the trend in medical, uh, the medical business model, that they're moving towards distributing or dispersing more, and they're starting to move towards more preventative rather than fixing people. And so the industry's changing, the needs are changing, and so we need to change too and I think we need to start encouraging the disbursement of medical services, not doing things to slow it down and hinder it. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that seems to be hindering it is all the proponents of certificate of need. Now, a lot of people don't, don't even know what that is. When I bring that up to people, I have to explain what it is. Sure. Uh, I'm not sure. I think that's been discussed here before, so I don't need to go into Yeah, I, I know you've had a discussion with Bill regarding a hospice carve-out for certificate of need in the past. Yeah, that's uh, that's most of the people agree that they deserve a, an exception to it, or, or, or they get to keep it. It's not exception. They get to keep sure. it. And the reason is, is that the hospice provides additional services over and above with just what Medicare pays. There's other people provide those services, but they do just enough to get their Medicare payments and no extra services, no community involvement. Our hospice provides a lot of additional services. They have a lot of volunteers. They do a good job, and everybody in the community really respects them and likes them. Mm -hmm. And so there was no issue about making a, a carve-out or let, exempting them from any cuts in certificate of need. Is, is that around the state that support exists or just um, in this area? Well, definitely in the panhandle. And I think other people didn't have a problem with it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it's, it, it didn't, didn't hurt anybody else. They didn't care. <laughs> I'm not sure if that's a fair statement, but okay. <laughs> it seemed that way. And so, but, uh, but that's kind of my feeling that, okay, hospice, leave them alone. Uh, in general, I think we need some uh, some competition to help expand uh, services. Uh, even locally, we, we touched on that just before the show, even locally, people are having trouble getting appointments. I know my own wife did. Uh, she had some kind of oh, nervous problems. I don't know if neurological or something that popped up recently. <laughs> We're not sure if it was COVID related or not. But she tried to get an appointment with her. There's a branch of medicine that specializes in this. She couldn't get an appointment for six, eight months. A lot of the doctors weren't taking new patients. And uh, the few of the doctors that were available were pretty far away, an hour or more away. And that was my first experience with shortages in this area. Mm -hmm. I've run into them with other people since then. You become aware of something, you start asking about it, comparing notes. We could do with more medical services locally. How would revoking of a certificate of need help that situation? It would take away the monopolies that certain parts of the medical profession have. Uh, the certificate of need is a little bit complicated. It actually applies to service by service, not by a, a company or an organization. Mm -hmm. And I think West Virginia probably has 26 medical services that are controlled or restricted by certificate of need. And there's an elaborate process defending the process. Mm -hmm. But the interesting thing about it, it all goes back to a federal program, I don't know, 20, 30 years ago, where they were trying to control medical service in a, in a way that we didn't overbuild or overprovide because they didn't want to waste resources. But that the federal government abandoned that after a few years. It wasn't working. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the states picked it up, and probably more than half of them still have it. But when they when I say that, they don't have it for all the services that are controlled. Some states only control it for one service, some for a handful, 
we're probably on the higher end by controlling 26 services and restricting them or making people go through an elaborate process of a, putting in an application and then existing hospitals and medical facilities can challenge it. So they end up in big long law lawsuits, spending a lot of money, a lot of time. And uh, that whole process is not totally a level paying field. I've heard that some people can get their certificate approved in weeks and months, mm -hmm. and others it takes years and money. So, but Bill? Yeah. Uh, Don, you've raised a lot of points, uh, and we can, we've can we discussed certificate of need several times in the past. Uh, I would lobby, I would argue, that uh, our medical care has increased immensely in the eastern panhandle uh, via the, the big hospitals. WVU affiliation with West Virginia University uh, has increased the uh, level of medical care by an order of magnitude over what it had before. As a consequence, uh, they've extended to medical care in Jefferson County to a level than way above what they had with the rural hospital. Same way with Morgan County with Valley Health. Uh, so yeah, you can we can nickel and dime and pick a certain issue as has been done in the past. It costs twice as much to have an MRI done at uh, Martinsburg uh, than it do, would in, in Hagerstown. That may be true, I don't know. But I would say the bottom line is we have pretty darn good medical care in the eastern panhandle. Uh, and uh, certificate of need, in my view, may get in the way but I don't think it gets in the way as much as some folks would argue. Certainly in the areas of hospice and our uh, trash pickup. If we did not have certificate of need for trash pickup, there would be large sectors of the county that would not have service. This is an issue that takes care of itself as we grow, right? Yeah. I mean, the, the certificates of need, as I understand them, are they guarantee a uh, <clears throat> excuse me? They guarantee business for a provider in return for guaranteed service from the provider. And as the Eastern Panhandle continues to grow, that's going to become more, it's going to become easier for more people to provide the services. So the need for certificates of need will go away. My question for you, as a, as a legislator, are the certificates of need provided by the legislator, no. by the legislature? Well, there's a group that's authorized to do it, but it's, so what is, I guess my point as you're, you're, you're running for office, you're running for the House of Delegates. So as a delegate, what is your role vis-a-vis -vis the, the certificates of need? Uh, we can modify how, how it's, how the needs are met. The, the needs, okay, I'm going to back up one step. Okay. One of the things that's amazed me about state government versus federal government is how many boards, commissions, and things we have and how much we delegate out to these groups that are a mixture of professionals, civilians, government people. There's a board in the system that that's their total job, just to process certificate of needs, and they make the rules, and they administer the rules, and they go through, you know, they approve or disapprove people. They have hearings for these needs. They let existing people challenge new people. So it's a big, long, elaborate process. And so, that, and so what we can do is change the charter of that group or exempt people from that group as a legislator. But we're probably going to totally replace that group, at least not at this stage. Don, your own record as of this morning that you're against blanket uh, certificate of need. There may be certain clawbacks and certain uh, exemptions, but by and large, again, let me change subject very quickly. Uh, you're in a race with, uh, you have two opponents, uh, Joseph DeSoto and Tammy uh, Hess. You have been accused by uh, Dr. DeSoto of stealing his signs, his uh, yard sign. Would you speak to that? Yes, I'm totally amazed that somebody would say things like that or do things like that or initiate a, a Facebook campaign of that nature. I mean, I, I feel it's totally beneath anything I want to deal with. I mean, I'm not sure if he actually ever lost any signs, but he's making wild claims like he's seen me do it or has people have seen me do it. Have you? <laughs> no. Okay. I mean, I'm way past that. He, 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 he like claims that. to have video evidence of it, too, Don. Well, I, have, well, you, it, have you asked to see the video? 
Uh, I've not heard that claim. I know he's claimed there's witnesses. We say, well, where are they? Why haven't you filed something with the police? Mm -hmm. Which he hasn't done, as far as I know. I haven't heard anything. But I just I don't want to engage it. I I'd like to stick with the issues. I think that people that know me know that this is nonsense. I think that people that know him know it's nonsense, but a lot of people don't really know him. And so, uh, and I don't, <laughs> I don't even want to engage in the discussion anymore. I think we have more important things to deal with than this kid stuff. So let's talk about that. What is the more important? You win re-election, you, 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 you're in for another term. What are your priorities beyond certificates of need? Oh, okay. Well, that was just one hot button. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's a lot of things going on. We're in the midst of a lot of things. And I've got a little cheat sure. sheet here. <laughs> and I'm not going to talk on each one. I'm just going to mention things. Uh, right now, broadband is a big deal. We've initiated it. We need to monitor it. It's a 10-year program, maybe more. It's stretching out. That's critical. Uh, we need. It has been monitored, is not the county commission. Gary Wine has his fingers on all the pulses of broadband. Uh, what what well, more should we be doing? Well, okay. Bringing it to my neighborhood. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. It's coming. It's coming. They, well, they're going to the faster, high, they're, they're going to the west of uh, 81 first, but it will be coming, John. Well, okay. The counties are involved, and there's some statewide money, and and then there's a lot of federal grant money involved. The problems they've run into is the actual backbones and how they're placed on telephone poles and some weird obstructions about things have to be certain levels and can the poles handle additional weight, things that most of us never even anticipated, slowing it down, causing problems. And so, and where we can, we have to try to clear some of these re roadblocks and keep it moving so that we can't just ignore it and say, okay, the states will handle it now. We need to monitor it and make sure it does keep progressing. I mean, we're not going to mess with it unless it really, really needs it. But broadband's one. We've, so we've looked into, and I think we've got the jails and prisons on the mend. Uh, most of us are familiar with there some deaths in parts of the state and so forth. A lot of repairs not done. I think that's changed. The management on that in that area has been changed. There's an inspector general set up, I think that's his right title, who was a former delegate, former policeman, doing a super job. He's reported to us, and he's he's Rob, actually, that's not me. <laughs> I think that calls for you. Do you need to get that? No, we'll wait. No, that's okay. I don't need that. He's actually visiting the facilities. He's pleased that with the new management, things are cleaned up. He's actually interviewing prisoners. That's on the mend. Now, it doesn't hurt there's a federal judge overseeing a lot of it, but that's another area that we're going to stay on top of and make sure it keeps going the right direction. DHHR reorganization. The organization has taken effect, but there's still a lot of sorting out, reorganizing. Uh, the administrative parts pulled out separate from the three new departments. So we need to keep an eye on it, make sure it progresses, because I would, I would venture a third or fourth of the state budget money to go through that one organization. All the welfare and so forth, food stamps, you name it, a lot of the medical things go through it. So we need to stay on top of it, make sure it goes where we hope it goes. Uh, economic and development in general, that's been a really a good success story. I think that it's critical to the state to reestablish base industries because then once you have the base industries, everything else grows. You, got, you need housing for workers. You need stores. You need auto dealers. You need bank. In other words, everything else, all the services build on top of base industries. And we know that we lost a lot of our base industries. They were curtailed. We went through the whole Appalachia problem. We're on the recovery. I think we're in, going into a renaissance period for this state, which is a flowery way to say we're recovering. <laughs> <laughs> but things are looking up. We need to keep it going, keep it moving. I'd like to see us move to the point where we've brought up our workforce problems. We don't have as much participation as we'd like. Uh, infrastructure problems, we're working on those uh, diligently, but it takes time and money. But we'll get to the point where we won't have to give companies incentives to come to West Virginia. We'll be in a point of saying we can pick who we want. <laughs> That's a little idealistic, I know, <laughs> but that would be a good goal. Okay, but so economic is a development is a success story. Education choice is a success story. 
uh, public education is another subject we hit later. <laughs> but the choice is there, and that's working. Donnie, down to about a final minute here or so. So if there's a final priority you want to make sure you get across, <laughs> now's the time to do it. Wow, this time went fast. <laughs> it does. People always say that. <laughs> okay. Okay. We've done a lot of good things. You asked me my priorities. Health, affordable health care distributed to all the rural areas that really need it. People have to travel hours to get to it. I know of one person that died waiting for an ambulance. I, there's probably other cases. But I'm aware of one personally. Uh, that, to me, is a high priority. Public schools, they, we, that's been a difficult problem. Our achievement is probably one of the lowest in the nation. And it's not the teacher's fault. It, I blame it on two things. The micromanagement from the federal government through the grant process and the embedded administrative structure in our government uh, uh, relative to education. I think there was a study 10 years ago that was tried to figure out what's wrong with our public school system. They said, well, you have too many administrators. Your ratio of administrators to teachers is one of the highest, well, not one of the highest, but among the highest in the country. We need to deal with that. We haven't done it yet. And uh, for a variety of reasons. I'm hoping with the new administrations, both state and federal, next, next year, we can really address these problems and start to fix them. Uh, okay, those are probably two of the bigger things. Uh, there's things in terms of decentralization. I think it's time some of the counties are re ready to be more independent and take over more of the local issues. The counties have been ready for a long time, Don. <laughs> it's the it's problem with the uh, legislators. Uh, well, all right, I won't argue that point. Uh, there's reasons they don't. Some of the counties aren't ready, and they, and they can't do this in a blanket way. They have to do it selectively. They get, the ones that are ready start giving them the freedoms. The ones that aren't quite ready or don't have the economic capacity to be, be ready, we have to help them bring them up where they can handle it. And, Don, on that note, I thank you for coming in. Oh, thank you. Good to see you again. Well, thanks. Don Forst, he'll be uh, next week, by the way, at the Berkeley County Commission Chamber offices for our candidate forum. That's uh, again on the 16th.